so I didn't, I forgot, I got a new watch. I didn't calibrate it for the second, so I'll just have to watch the clock on my computer to see when two o'clock rolls around. But are you, are you ready, Emily, when I say go? Sure, let me share okay. my screen again. Okay. You, okay. you can do that, yeah, share your screen now. That way I'll, uh, I'll have no excuse for botching your title. Um, but I don't see it there, so I do have an excuse. Great. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay, but now I can't see my own notes. So hang on a second. Okay. Well, just tell me when you're tell me when you're ready, and I'll start recording and give you an introduction. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce Emily Cliff today, who's going to be our speaker and talk on moduli spaces, principal two group bundles, and the categorification of the Fried Quinn line bundle. All right, thank you for the invitation and the introduction. Um, so I'm going to speak today about some joint work with Dan Berwick Evans, Laura Murray, Apriva Nakade, and Emma Phillips. And this is a project that we started at the um, Mathematical Research Community on geometric representation theory and equivariant elliptic cohomology that Dan and I organized along with a few other people. And so, uh, yeah, thank you to the AMS for supporting that. And also a little advertisement, if you or your graduate students ever get the opportunity to go to one of these things, uh, I found it very rewarding. All right, so the plan for the talk is the following. I'm going to start with some context and motivation then um, the, the bulk of the talk will be um, some definitions and results about principal two group bundles. And I'll conclude with some applications and work in progress. Um, yes. All right. So here's our context and motivation. Let's fix a compact Lie group and a degree three cohomology class. And depending on your background, your brain may have automatically jumped to something because it turns out that there are lots of fun things that we can do with this data. So here's an incomplete list. We can study Chern Simon theory. We could study G equivariant elliptic cohomology. We could define and study string structures, equivariant gerbs, higher representation theory, and so on. And the focus of today's talk is that we can define a smooth two group curly G associated to this data. And then we can define and study its moduli space of principal two group bundles. So the vague expectation, which you see sort of implicitly or less implicitly throughout the literature is that all of the above topics are related to each other and um, more specifically, that they're more, they're meaningfully related through the geometry of this moduli space of principal two group bundles. So as I said, the focus of the talk will be on this moduli space. And I will talk about some connections explicitly to chern simons theory and to string structures. Now, all of these things are hard and technical. And so we begin with a simplifying um, assumption, we focus mainly on the case that G is a finite group. This was the assumption that we made to begin with because we had no idea where to start. And we did really think that this was a, a huge assumption that we were making, but we were pleasantly surprised that we felt that we got a lot of intuition and ideas for how to proceed in the general case, just from the finite case. And so I will mention some, some ongoing work in that direction. But the advantage of the finite case is that we have um, some very concrete hands-on descriptions and group cohomology calculations. So let's fix some input data. So G is going to be a finite group. A is going to be an abelian Lie group. Um, often, U1, but many of our results can be stated in more generality. Um, and I'm going to equip it with the trivial G action. Many of the definitions and results could be stated for a non-trivial G action, but um, we don't bother mostly and our applications 
are usually for U1 with the trivial action. So let's keep that simplifying assumption. And now I'm gonna choose a representative of my class. So in the discrete case, this is just going to be a, a three co cycle. Okay. So before I get into the two groups, let me start with um, the Chern Simon story attached to this data. So in the finite case, this is first studied by Digraph and Witten and then expanded on by Fried and Quinn. So what Fried and Quinn do is they construct a line bundle, which I'm going to call L on the moduli space of principal G bundles on Riemann surfaces. And for X, a given Riemann surface, we can pull back, we get a line bundle, which I'm going to denote by L sub X on one G of X. And the relation um, to Chern Simon's theory is that the global sections on bun G of X of this line bundle is the vector space that Chern Simons assigns to X. Okay. Um, so we'll see this line bundle appearing later towards the end of the talk. Um, so I wanted to to give the context. Um, a, a quick elliptic aside is that if we restrict um, the line bundle L to the moduli space of principal G bundles over elliptic curves, Let's denote that by L tilde. And Nora Ganter has shown that L tilde is the natural home of twisted G equivariant elliptic cohomology. So that's one of these connections um, between these fields that I mentioned at the beginning. Okay. But now let me um, introduce the two, two group story. So the theory um, behind this is that the class of alpha determines Um, an isomorphism class, equivalence class of finite two groups that are central extensions, extensions of G by the groupoid with one object and morphisms given by A. So let me be more explicit by a two group, we mean a monoidal groupoid. So a category with a tensor structure where every object is invertible. And we have different flavors of two groups where we have specified inverses or not specified inverses. We just want them to exist. So we have coherent two groups and things like this. For us, it's not that important. We're working in a very concrete example. So starting with the representative, so my three co-cycle alpha we associate, so we're gonna define a category G whose objects are the elements of my original group. So that's a finite set of objects here. The morphisms, well, this is gonna be a skeletal category, meaning that the Hom sets between two elements will be empty 
if the elements are not equal. And when they are equal, then we get the automorphism group, which is exactly A. And then finally, I want to make this into a monoidal category. So I need a tensor structure. And on objects, it will be given by the tensor product of two objects is their product in G. Now to make this into a monoidal category, I need associativity. Um, so I need an, an identification between the tensor product GH tensored with K and G tensored with the tensor product of H and K. Now these are as objects, they're both defined by the same element of G. And so and the, the morphisms between these objects is a copy of A. And so to specify this isomorphism, I should give an element of A and that's exactly what my three co-cycle is doing in this picture. And then one can show that the pentagon axiom, so the compatibility with associativity for four objects is exactly equivalent to the co-cycle condition for A. So that's, uh, um, this is an abstract, an abstract two group, a monoidal category with this structure. And I'm going to make it into a smooth two group. Um, so depending on the smooth structure of A. So one way to think about this um, explicitly is to look at the, the bi category of bi bundles. So our objects are Lie groupoids, our morphisms are um, bi bundles between groupoids, and then our two morphisms are isomorphisms. And using the fact that A was a Lie algebra, a Lie group, um, we, can, we can view G as a group object. So again, the objects of G are discrete, but the morphisms here are not. So we, we do have an interesting smooth two group. So what am I gonna do with this information today? I'm going to define a moduli space. And by that, I really mean a bi-category of principal two group bundles over a manifold X. Um, we'll see that there's a nice forgetful sort of map from two group bundles to ordinary bundles. And the claim is that when X is a Riemann surface, this categorifies the free twin line bundle. Namely, that when I take isomorphism classes along fibers, what I get is a, a U1 bundle or a line bundle and that it is canonically isomorphic to the free twin line bundle. And so that will give us an interpretation of sections of L. There'll be isomorphism classes of lifts from ordinary bundles to two group bundles. And finally, um, I'll discuss some applications to string structures potentially string geometry. So that's the context and the plan. Are there any questions so far? I neglected to say at the beginning that if you have questions, uh, please feel free to speak up and ask directly. And if there are any questions in chat, I will relay them to the speaker, if possibly after aggregation. Thank you. Okay. So now let's move on to the, um, more technical part of the talk. So I'm gonna fix a smooth two group um, and often I will assume that it is finite but not for the, for the results, but not for the definitions. And I'll fix a smooth manifold X. And so my goal is to define a bi category of smooth to group bundles. On X. And when we first started this project, we had um, several working definitions that, that uh, came to mind. So one thing you could do is, is um, refer to Lurie and say, well, a two group is an infinity group and we could just define everything in infinity category language and then say, these are special cases. 
Um, so this would definitely work. However, we wanted to take advantage of the fact that even that we're in a very concrete setting, um, very explicit. And so we wanted to write down a lot of things explicitly. And so we wanted a, a more um, concrete definition. So the definition that we ended up working with is the following, but I'll explain a few connections later on to other definitions that might come to mind, all of which are generalizing classical G bundles, uh, depending on your favorite perspective on those. So a principal curly G bundle on X is a smooth stack P equipped with a map to X, um, which is equipped with the action of G, which is locally trivial. Um, meaning that there exists a surjective submersion U from some manifold Y into X and a, and a trivialization, so an isomorphism of G stacks over Y, I'm gonna call it D from the pullback of my stack P to the trivial G bundle, which is this one. So, so far, except for this word stack appearing, this looks word for word like the definition of a classical G bundle. I just wanna highlight here that when I say there's an action, um, maybe I'll highlight even in a darker color, that that means not only that we have a map from X, from P cross G into P, but that we have data that says that it's an action. Um, and similarly over here, um, to specify an isomorphism of G stacks is the data of this map, but also data of equivariance. Okay. So when one takes this approach for defining classical bundles, one quickly realizes that a nice thing to do is to assume that you start with a trivial bundle over a cover and see how to glue it together. And that is encoded in, in check data. So we can do the same thing in this situation. So check data for curly P tells us how to glue G bundles from the trivial bundle. Want to cover why? So the first thing that we do begins exactly the same way as it does in the classical case. The first piece of gluing data is a map on the twofold cover. that says that we can glue the trivial bundle to itself along this map. Now, the thing that's special in this case um, is that phi is a bi-bundle. Okay. And I haven't said at all what a bi-bundle is, but in particular, Um, is in particular a, a principal A bundle. So we can, um, what we want to do is assume that not only is our bundle trivial on this cover Y, that the by bundle is trivial. So I'm going to refine Y until I can assume 
that phi is trivial as an A bundle. Okay. And so then instead of having just a co-cycle condition on threefold covers, I'll have trivialization data for that A bundle. And I'll end up with three pieces of data. So I have my, my cover Y, and then I have a section of the trivial bundle here. Um, and then I have a third piece of data, which is a map on the threefold cover into our automorphism space A. And then these should satisfy some kind of co-cycle conditions. And so the first theorem that we prove is that um, the category of check data of triples like this with um, natural, a natural bicategory structure is equivalent to the category of uh, two group bundles. So as a first example, um, we can consider A gerbs. And in this framework, it's a point mod A bundle. So this is the case where the group G is trivial. So our check data now, the second piece, this row is not interesting at all. And our check data is two pieces, U from Y into X and gamma from the threefold product into A, which is just a two co-cycle. So this recovers the um, well-known fact that gerbs are classified by two co-cycles. And um, I'm gonna make a second definition at this point. It's not an example, but it's, I'm making a definition by generalization of this, um, or by analogy, an A2 gerb is determined by the check data of a cover and a three co-cycle. Okay, so we'll use that definition later and I just wanted to point out the, the similarities here. Now, an observation that we make is that we have a forgetful functor which we denote pi from this bi category of two group bundles to the category of ordinary bundles. In terms of the definition that I gave of, of stacks with an action, we can take isomorphism classes of that and um, the curly G collapses into G, all our fibers. In terms of check data, we can also just send the triple U rho gamma to the pair U rho. And so our theorem about this forgetful functor is that the fiber is easy to understand. So it's a torsor over the symmetric monoidal bicategory. of gerbs. Um, why is this a symmetric monoidal bi category? In terms of the check data here, we can just multiply in A and use that A as an abelian group. Okay, so let me sketch the proof uh, briefly to see that using the check data, this is, um, becomes very easy. So the fiber 
over a bundle P with check data given by a pair U and rho is just the gammas that complete the triple. U rho gamma. And the first observation that we make is that P together with alpha. So the choice of bundle together with our co-cycle, alpha determines the check co-cycle. Which I'm gonna denote by lambda sub P alpha, or sometimes it's denoted by the pullback of alpha. It goes from the fourfold product over X into A. What does it do? If we have four elements of our cover, we can evaluate each consecutive pair to get three elements of G. And then we can plug that into alpha. Um, so a check three, a three co-cycle we've said is a two gerb. And this is not just any two gerb, it has a, a name. So in the literature, this is called the Chern Simons two gerb, for example, in work by Waldorf. So the two claims that we make to complete the proof of the theorem is that the data of gamma that completes a triple is equivalent to a trivialization of this two gerb. And secondly, the by category of trivializations of a fixed two gerb is a torsor over the symmetric monoidal category of gerbs. So together our fibers are the trivializations of some two gerb that's varying as we move in the base, but each of those fibers is non-canonically a copy of, of gerbs. And this fact here is two categorical levels up from the well-known fact that uh, trivializations of a, or automorphisms of a trivial principal bundle are functions into Okay, so that completes this proof, which I wanted to sketch because um, this Chern-Simons gerb and trivializations of it will, will appear later. Okay, so, so far we've seen two approaches uh, to principal two group bundles. One was in terms of stacks with a G action. The second was in terms of check data. Um, a third is a kind of homotheoretic approach. So, what if we tried to define them in terms of classifying stacks? So the naive expectation would be that G bundles are classified by maps from X into the classifying space of curly G. Okay, well, I haven't told you what the classifying space is, but here's a proposed definition. Alpha gives me a map from the classifying space of G into B3 of A. Over B3 of A, I have a point. And when I pull this back, my claim is that this is BG. Okay. And so then if that's a good definition for BG, what would I take to produce a map from X into BG? 
Well, on the one hand, I would need a map here corresponding to a principal bundle. And on the other hand, I need a map here. Well, that's no data. And in order to produce a map here, the last thing I need is that the diagram should commute. Namely, I should have an isomorphism, which I will conveniently call gamma, between this composition, that's rho upper star of alpha, which was also lambda p alpha, our two gerb, should be isomorphic to the trivial two gerb, which is what we get when we compose this way and map via the point. So in other words, the data that we need to make this diagram commute or to lift rho to a map into the curly G is exactly, again, a trivialization of this two gerb. So this perspective is consistent. It's a little aside there for people who prefer that approach. Okay. For the next part of the talk, I'm going to focus on flat bundles. So a flat principle Really, G bundle is a principle um, G delta bundle, where here I take the same abstract two group, but I give it the discrete topology. And so this was kind of the, uh, a fourth approach to defining bundles. If we only care about this situation, what we can try to do is generalize this fact from classical flat bundles. So flat principle, ordinary G bundles are classified by homomorphisms. from pi one of X into G. And so we want an, an analogous description of two group, flat two group bundles. And indeed, okay, we make the simplifying assumption that X has contractible universal cover um, so that we can work with pi one of X instead of higher um, homotopy groupoids. We, suspect that more general results can be formulated. So let me start over here. We have our flat G bundles living over flat ordinary group bundles. Okay, we're in the finite situation. So the flat here is superfluous. But, and we know that this category downstairs is equivalent to the category of functors between these groupoids, point mod pi one and point mod G, which is the same thing as the action groupoid, where I look at group homomorphisms from pi one X to G and I quotient by the conjugation action of G. And what's the thing that goes into the top corner to complete this? It is exactly what the best thing we could hope for. Functors of bi categories between pi one of X, point mod pi one X and point mod curly G. So here, this is a two category. This is a one category viewed as a two category. And the result is that we have an equivalence here that we have a nice forgetful functor here that I'll call pi and, and it has the interpretation you would hope for that it's induced by the projection from curly G onto straight G. Okay, 
So this is a by category whose objects are homomorphisms um, from pi one X into G. So let me expand a little bit what we mean by that. So to give a homomorphism of two groups, I need to give a definition on objects. So it should just be a function like this, which needs to be a homomorphism. But remember, we're viewing these as monoidal categories. So it's not enough to say that it's a homomorphism. I need to provide a monoidal structure. In other words, for all A and B in my fundamental group, I need to specify an isomorphism between row A times row B and row AB as objects of my two group G, meaning I need to specify an element which I'm going to call gamma AB in A. And this should satisfy a co-cycle condition. Um, that in, when, I, when you write out this condition, you will start to see the associativity in curly G playing a role. So this co-cycle condition will involve terms with alpha. So those are our objects. Our one morphisms are going to be natural transformations. Um, and in the classical setting, let's forget about our gammas. We saw that the, the morphisms in this category are given by conjugation by G. Right? So, the first thing we need is an element of our group such that for any thing in the fundamental group, um, T row one A T inverse is equal to row two A. So we're just conjugating row one to row two. And then of course, in the two group setting, we don't just want that to be true. We want um, a morphism. So for all, a in pi one of X, I need a morphism from T row one of A to row two A of T. And let's call this say eta A. It's again going to be an element of A. And again, it should satisfy a co-cycle condition. So all of this data um, comes out of our check description when we restrict to the case that all of our functions are locally constant. Okay. And finally, there are two morphisms. Two morphisms are not that interesting. Um, they only occur between natural transformations that are already equal. And then the automorphism group is given by A. So in the case of flat bundles, we can re-describe our um, bicategory of bundles in terms of homomorphisms in this way. Um, and we were looking at this, this nice forgetful functor, which we know is a torsor. So we know it's a fibration um, and we would like to have a cleavage. And so what we do is we show that the action of G downstairs. So this is what's giving us all the morphisms in the category downstairs, lifts to an action of G on the by category. of functors and what this gives us is a way of lifting morphisms downstairs to morphisms between fibers upstairs. In other words, this gives pi the structure of a cloven two vibration. And roughly what this buys us is um, a very concrete 
hands-on way of taking isomorphism classes along fibers, which is exactly what we're going to do when we start to look at applications. So let's return to the case of the Friedkin line bundle. So now X is a Riemann surface and A is U1. And we've seen that pi from the category of flat G bundles to the category of flat ordinary G bundles is a cloven two vibration with fibers equivalent non-canonically to the category of flat gerbs on X. And so using this cleavage, we can take isomorphism classes along fibers. And now we use the fact that our fibers turn into isomorphism classes of gerbs, which we know are given by H2 of X with coefficients in U1, which is U1 we end up with a principal U1 bundle. Okay. On this moduli space of G bundles. And so our theorem here is that the associated line bundle is the freed Quinn line bundle. Okay. And so, uh, yeah, I just wanna draw attention to work of Willerton for the case that X is a torus. This is a paper about uh, Drinfeld doubles where he used two groups and also produced this frequent line bundle in, in the case of the torus and gave um, explicit uh, co-cycles, which we matched with ours. And that was what first gave us this idea. And then we realized we could generalize to other, other manifolds, X. So this is the finite case. Let me make a brief digression to talk about recent work in progress towards the general case. So we start by studying um, categorical tori, which is the name that Nora Ganter gives to extensions. So it's a U point mod U1 extension of a compact torus. Okay, so now we've lost discreteness, but we've gained abelianness and we have a nice cover of our group. So our given by the Lie algebra. So our cohomology calculations are not too bad. Okay, so in this case, we again study um, the category of functors. I guess I was writing home. between this category viewed as a two category and this point mod T. Okay, we can write this pretty explicitly. And again, it lives over this category of Homs, the classical case, okay, which is, um, ah, let me focus on the case that uh, X is T2 torus with pi one uh, equal to Z squared. 
So this is bundles, flat bundles on the torus. And also because the torus is, uh, because the fundamental group is free abelian on two generators, this is just two copies of T. Okay, so we study this by category. And again, we can take isomorphism classes. And so a theorem, I've labeled it with a question mark because we figured this out last week and have not written the details out yet, but that this um, vibration categorifies the line bundle that we see in Chern Simons. So in a billion Chern Simons, whose um, curvature is given by the Atiyah bot. Symplectic form. Okay. So um, yeah, I guess it would be fair to say that we were pleasantly surprised that um, without too much difficulty, we were able to go from the um, discrete case to the compact case, even in the case of a torus, in that we are optimistic uh, about the general case. Okay. Uh, and let me finish with some discussions about string structures. And really this is maybe everybody's favorite two group. Maybe I'm speaking for everybody, I don't know. But this was kind of the, the goal all along um, is to understand the string two group and its principal bundles. So obviously we're not there yet, it's not finite. Um, oh, and I've written a reminder here to, to cite Shomer Priest who gave this presentation of the string group as a two group, which gives us the advantage of being finite dimensional, but the disadvantage of having to worry about higher, higher categorical stuff. So Chris Schumer Priest tells us we can look at um, a point mod U1 extension of spin N. And this gives us the string group. Now we're going to um, maybe somewhat artificially force this into the finite group setting as follows. Let's start with a finite group G naught and a representation G naught into SON. And let's produce a finite two group, which is related to string. So I'm gonna do this a series of two pullbacks. First of all, I pull back from SON to spin N and I get a twofold cover of my finite group. So it's still finite. And then I pull back one more time and now I've got a point mod U1 extension. So it's curly G of exactly the form that we've been studying so far. All right, so in this case, um, let's start with an oriented vector bundle with structure group G naught. So this is something living downstairs. So a classical definition is that a spin structure on P naught should be a lift to a G bundle P. And once we have this diagram um, using Schomer Priest's formalisms, it's easy to make the following definition, which Schomer Priest does. He says that a string structure on this G bundle P should be a lift to a curly G bundle on P. On the other hand, before having access to the two group description of the string group, this was not a definition that could be easily formulated and instead, Waldorf gives us the following definition, um, which is that a string structure on P is a trivialization of the two gerb, so the Chern Simons two gerb lambda P alpha. 
And in light of our results about the fiber of, um, of our, our, forget, our forgetful functor, we know that to choose a lift of P, I don't know why I have a, a sentence doesn't make sense. It should be a lift to a curly G bundle, curly P. So we know that the fibers of curly P's living over P is exactly the category of trivializations of this tube So um, it's a consequence of our theorem that these two definitions coincide in the case of finite groups and hopefully in general as well. There's a third definition, which we can also compare with. Um, so let's start with a principal flat G bundle and consider chern simons theory for that bundle P. So I'm gonna call that CSP. This is a definition given by Stoltz and Teichner. They say that a geometric string structure on P is a trivialization of chern simons theory, CSP. Okay. So there's some work to do to unpack what that means, but in particular, on the level of two manifolds, so if I have a map into X, a CFP assigns to F a line, and a trivialization of CSP would mean that we have a non-zero point in that line, and we have this compatibly and functorially and all of this. Okay, now, We've told you that a non-zero point in that line is an isomorphism class of a flat G bundle over the pullback F upper star of P. And so if we already had a um, string structure in schumer priests sense on P, so if we had a lift curly P, a flat lift, then we could pull that back and we would get these isomorphism classes in all the way that we want. So in other words, at least on the two-dimensional level, um, the data of a trivialization of CSP matches up with this, the data, part of the data, so the isomorphism class of curly P, and it seems um, that one could write it down in general for, for the rest of, of this story. Okay, so that, that is all that I have to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking Emily for her interesting talk. Are there any questions? Do you have a hand up or are you clapping? I have a question. Um, I didn't understand what this cloven structure is that you mentioned. Yeah, okay, so um, what we want to do is have a way that says, um, all right, so in one category level down, we have uh, like categories fibered in groupoids. Which tells me that for every um, object downstairs, I have a groupoid upstairs. And that if I have F from X to Y downstairs, I should get a pullback functor from in the opposite direction upstairs and everything should be compatible. So we want a category fibered in two groupoids. And um, yeah, and so in our case, our downstairs here is consisting of, um, we're using this description here, actual group homomorphisms, I1 of X into G, mod g and so um for every row i want 
a groupoid C rho. And for every T that conjugates rho to rho prime. So in other words, T is an element of G, rho prime should be equal to T rho T inverse. I want a functor between C rho prime and C rho, or it's gonna be an isomorphism because this is an isomorphism. So the direction doesn't matter. So in our case, because we're working with an action groupoid downstairs, um, the morphisms are given by G acting. And so it's enough to, to say, ah, if I have, so each of these guys are going to be subcategories of my bicategory functors. And so if I have an action of G up here, then I can define this functor to be act by G or act by T. G. I don't know if that addressed the question. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So what, what can you say about bun curly G to bun G for infinite G? Um, so, so far, nothing. Uh, so this is our work in progress. Okay. Um, and so we, we expect that it's not going to be so hard to relate this category to flat bundles, but we haven't done it explicitly yet. Um, and then, then the hope is that once we can do tori, then we can do, um, we can extend to other G by saying that G bundles are vile equivariant T bundles. Are there other questions? Yeah, just uh, maybe a simple question. So your construction for the um, two group bundles are, it, it seems different from the literature where I've seen people use um, cross modules to define flat connections, etc. Yeah, so ours are not, our two groups are not examples of cross modules. I see, yeah, because in the, um, sort of like the construction for the flat uh, connections, I sort of expected the pi two, the homotopy two type to show up, but you only have pi one. So um, yeah. yeah, and and um, what is it, the gamma, I believe? That's what you wrote. Um, the gamma is a group two co-cycle, is that right? Mm -hmm. I see. And um, I mean, the reason that pi one is the only thing that's showing up is because we, we sort of artificially forced it in this statement of the theorem, we do think that for a more general X, we would need to look at um, a two category of the fundamental group. But, but yes, our, our two groups are not cross modules. Okay, I see, I see. So can you comment a little bit about, um, like aside from pi one, just the fundamental group, right? What topology can this bundle, can this flat bundle probe? It's kind of a vague question, but. Yeah. Um, no, I, th I think I, we, we don't know yet. We're still okay. Okay. hoping that, I, I, it, we feel a little bit that, oh yeah, I, that's it. Okay. Um, but the discrete case is, is almost too simple. So there's clearly gonna be a lot more structure there. And so for example, um, in the torus case, another thing we want to do is to study, we know, um, we know that there should be a holomorphic structure on this line bundle if, if we um, put a complex structure on, on T2, for example. And so can we understand that from the geometry of two groups? Um, so that's an, yeah. I see, I see, okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Further questions? Okay, well then let's uh, thank Emily once again.
And uh, the next talk in the series will be in three weeks. Uh, so Eric Zaslow will be speaking on February 28th. So hope to see you then. Thank you.